Madison's Notes, the official podcast of Princeton University's James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. I'm your host, Annika Nordquist. Today, I'm excited to introduce demographer and political economist Nicholas Eberstadt. Dr. Eberstadt holds the Henry Wendt Chair in Political Economy at the American Enterprise Institute and is a senior advisor at the National Bureau of Asian Research. He has a wide range of interests, both as an expert on the demographics of Asia and on poverty and social well-being. Today, we're going to discuss his domestic work, specifically his book, Men Without Work, which he recently republished in a new post-pandemic edition. I hope you enjoyed this conversation about how and why men are leaving the American workforce en masse. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to follow, subscribe, and give us a review. You can also find us on Twitter at Madison Program and find out more about us at jmp.princeton.edu. With no further ado, I hope you enjoy. Nick, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Thanks for inviting me, Annika. So to start off, uh, COVID has been a turning point in so many ways and on so many issues. Uh, And the fact that you've chosen to republish this same book both before and after COVID seems to suggest that in the labor market and specifically in the issue of male unemployment, uh, this has been no exception. So A, what led you to focus on this topic initially? And B, what happened during the pandemic that led you to believe that this issue needed to be re-upped. Well, thank you for asking. Well, in what laughingly passes for my career, (laughs) I've kind of tried to earn my living pointing out problems that are hiding in plain sight in different areas. And when I published the first edition of this book in 2016, I called The Men Without Work Problem, America's invisible crisis. Mm -hmm. Uh, The reason I said it was an invisible crisis is that for 50 years, without much comment, uh, we had been suffering a collapse of work for men, mainly driven by a flight from the labor market, a kind of an almost steady flight for half a century. It occurred to me that I should do something about this a couple of years beforehand when I was listening to all this happy talk about how unemployment was at near record lows. And at the same time, I was reading about how half of the American population in opinion polls said that they thought we were still in a recession. Now, how do those two things go together? Well, you can uh, make them go together if a huge chunk of the uh, manpower in the country isn't actually in the workforce. So that's how that's how this thing, uh, how this uh, book or study kind of started off. I just kind of like pulled on a thread, and the more I saw, the more I became concerned about how many different sorts of ways this problem was affecting the United States. There were no there were no good consequences of this. One of the strangest things about the um, about the findings was that the flight from work, the dropout rate for men 25 to 54, this uh, so-called prime uh, working age group, was almost a straight line from uh, 1965 to 2015. I mean, it's almost a straight line. Uh, I mean, it's it's the social sciences, so it's a little bit wiggly, but it's for human beings, it's almost a social science straight line. Uh, six years later, I mean, we've, we had the pandemic, we had this catastrophe, we had the economic crisis, we've had the uh, strange re- recovery, partial recovery from it. Six years later, it's almost exactly the same straight line upwards. I could have st- I could have started in 2015 and just drawn the same straight line for another six or seven years, and that's exactly where we are. I don't have an explanation for that. I mean, th- things like that, things that like that make it look like a, a geological fact <laughs> rather than a social or economic fact, and I can't explain to you why that's the case right now, but. Needless to say, that means it has gotten worse. Of course, we had a catastrophe in which over a million Americans died. It's been traumatic and is still traumatizing. With respect to the labor market, it's not just the prime age men who have been dropping out of the workforce. In the aftermath of the COVID pandemic, 
we seem to have a new emerging face to the flight from work in modern America. We're about 3 million, roughly speaking, about 3 million persons short in, the, uh, in terms of labor force of where we would have expected to be on pre-pandemic trends. And that's not all men. It's not all the prime age men. We now have uh, uh, a shortfall of older workers, of people 55 or 65 and older, men and women. And we seem to have something, something curious maybe happening with younger women. And I use younger advisedly, 25 to 54, uh, with the prime age women. I'm not sure that I would say we've got a four alarm fire there, but I think we have a yellow light flashing because there are things that are happening there that are a little bit too close to what we've already seen with the men without work syndrome. Hmm. And I want to harp a little bit more on this question of of the male-female difference, because I guess it's one of the things that sort of strikes one as particularly controversial about the book is the the idea of focusing on a problem that specifically to men um, is is kind of unusual um, to say that it's an issue that that men specifically um, are not back at work. It's kind of an unpopular thing to do. Do you think that there are kind of sociological differences in men without work versus women without work? What was your reason for kind of focusing on that particular gender dynamic? Well, the reason for it was pretty simple. Uh, I took a look at what was happening with guys and it had been happening there'd been this collapse of work for half a century. So it's, it, it had gone from being a problem to a historical fact. And, you know, historical facts have, you know, big entrenched historical facts have all sorts of, you know, causes and dynamics. We know that. But it was, it was something which was, it seemed to me to be um, not only worth looking at, but uh, essential to look at. Uh, and, we we see we have seen some of the same phenomenon with women, with a decline in labor force participation with uh, prime age women, but it began later. It began around the turn of the century, and it's been much less acute than for the guys. So it just seemed kind of natural that you should look at the big uh, big problem there. I mean, it is true that especially. In the academy, um, you know, uh, working age men are not a, uh, if you want to call it this way, they're not a protected class. They're not a victim group usually described uh, in social policy outside of the academy. They're not the group that's usually considered to be a, like a vulnerable group that uh, needs special uh, you know, consideration for social policy. The reason for that is because more or less forever, uh, prime age men are supposed to have been providers. And they're, whether it's a social construct or a sociobiological reality or however you want to look at it, it goes back a long time and to a lot of different places. So when you see a large group of men who go from being providers to being dependents, there's something kind of strange and unusual that is happening. Yeah. And it kind of begs a question, right? How much of an issue is it for us if the people who aren't victims or who haven't been viewed as victims suddenly aren't able to kind of be the backbone that they have been? Yeah, it's kind of a sad development. And I I just saw a stat this morning uh, from Pew that uh, there are now at this juncture more women than men for the first time uh, who have college degrees, like currently in the workforce. Well, there's, I mean, there is a genesis. I mean, there is a literature of um, that has looked at the question of whether men are dispensable in a modern or a postmodern age, and you know, and it's everything from. George Gilder um, back in the 70s with Visible Man to anthropologist Lionel Tiger with the, you know, the dispensable male to Christina Hoff Summers and the war against boys. I mean, there's lots and lots of um, there's lots and lots of work that's been done on this. I mean, what what I think is what I think helps to explain the, uh, if you will, the benign neglect that this problem uh, has been accorded is the fact that um, the men without work haven't been burning cars and rioting in the streets and making themselves a menace to society. 
uh, they have instead been much more likely to stay at home and uh, uh, become atomized, disconnected uh, from society, family, work, community, uh, addicted to substances, and courting deaths of despair. It's the quiet misery and desperation, which I'm afraid has been one of the reasons that society has been able to overlook this problem for so long. And I want to ask you a little bit about that as well, because I think the the idea that there's a distinction between leisure and idleness uh, is a distinction that's usually left kind of for philosophers. Um, but you're an economist, and you've kind of looked at this from a numerical perspective. And I, I guess I was kind of surprised to see that, you know, the difference between people who spend their free time reading versus who spend their free time on their phones and such are really reflected in the numbers. Can you comment a little bit on that? The people who are stepping out of the workforce, what are they actually doing with their time? Sure. Well, to begin with, modern economists are taught a lot of neat tricks. And if you, if you have a well-behaved statistical data set, you can do all sorts of neat tricks. Um, but if you don't have a well-behaved statistical data system, you tend to be like a dog with a dish and to look for a set that's you know, kind of like where you can do your tricks. Um, that's, that's one tick that uh, modern economists have. There's another smaller tick, but it's relevant here, Annika, which is people are taught from more or less their first class in economics to call free time leisure, all right? And this, and this is just wrong, <laughs> just uh, the wrong word to be using, because there's, there are a specific set of activities uh, or allocations of free time that conduce to leisure. I mean, leisure is something which is supposed to be restorative and uplifting, and not everything that you do with one does with one's free time is restorative and uplifting. One can do things that are degrading or abominable with one's free time as well. And I am, uh, I am not a theologian, but there is about 2,000 years of um, there is about 2,000 years of thinking about which leads to uh, you know the sorts of ideas like the uh, the seven deadly sins and sloth right and the scandal of encouraging other people to sin. So what the book shows, uh, I think, in a really kind of sobering statistical manner, is what the men without work themselves say they're doing with their time. This comes from time use surveys that the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics puts together for, you know, other purposes, for like trying to figure out when people are going to work and stuff like that. Um, they ask all adults, they ask a big sample of all adults employed or not, what they're doing, for, you know, morning, noon, and night. The, uh, the men who are neither employed nor in education and training because some of the labor force dropouts are temporary, they're full-time students, leave them out. If you look at the great majority who are basically long-timers, long-termers, they report that they basically don't do civil society. They, they report that they don't do much worship or volunteering or charity. And although they have an awful lot of free time, they don't do an awful lot of help around the house, either with house chores or with um, other people in the home. What they say they do is watch. They say that they watch screens. They, the surveys don't tell us what type of screen. Surveys don't tell us what they're watching. But they're you know, like about 2,000 hours a year. I mean, like a pretty good full-time job. And then there are other, other um, components, you know, special components in special years where uh, they where we get other information before the pandemic in one of these components they asked about you know do you take pain medication and almost half of the guys said yes I take mm. pain medication every day now that isn't necessarily opioids but it gives this I mean it gives this a heartrending picture of not just, you know, being on the couch playing, I don't know, Call of Duty or whatever, but playing at stoned. And 
it's a certain sort of skill set, but it's not a skill set that's going to get you back into work. It's a skill set that's going to you know, put you on a track towards the depths of despair, I'm afraid, in too many cases. And I guess to, to zoom out a little bit, so we were talking about there, there's a certain number of men who are with work. There's a certain number of men who are without work, which is kind of the focus of your book. Um, what can we say broadly about like the average person in each of these categories? Because we know sort of across the board, there are these sociological trends happening in America right now, increase of opioid addiction, deaths of despair, decrease of religion and such. But like when you've dug into the numbers, when you look at sort of the average person working versus not working, what have you found? Well, if we're going to talk about guys who are labor force dropouts, um, you know, at the moment, there are over 7 million of them. Wow. So if you have 7 million people in a group, then you're going to find everything. I mean, you're going to find what you want, right? <laughs> it's a big group. But there are trends. I mean, some people are overrepresented. So um, in terms of ethnicity, African-Americans are overrepresented, but other minority groups like Asian and Latino Americans are underrepresented. You know, on balance, it means there's not a big difference between Anglo and so-called minority uh, participation. Um, education is just what you'd think. It skews uh, it, it skews against against the favor of people who have less uh, educational attainment. Um, but that said, about forty percent of the men in this dropout group uh, have at least some college. And a fifth, maybe more than a fifth, have a college degree or more. So it's not all high school dropouts. With uh, with respect to family and marriage, as you you were asking about, this is a really important predictor. Uh, uh, guys who are married are way less likely, all other things being equal, they're way less likely to be in this pool of labor force dropouts. Guys who have never been married, all other things being equal, are way more likely to be in this pool. Interestingly enough, also, leave aside marital status. If if you have uh, kids under the age of 16, I mean, under the age of 18, under the same roof as you, you're way more likely to be in the workforce, no matter you know, no matter what your ethnicity, no matter what your education. I mean, if, I, I think that looks like a kind of like a provider impulse. Hmm. And then um, the Census Bureau has this um, category that they artlessly call nativity. And you know, it's not about Christmas <laughs> scenes. It's like, were you born in the country or not? And here it's really striking. Um, foreign born guys, no matter what their ethnicity are distinctly more likely than their native-born counterparts to be in the workforce. And I guess, you know, we've talked a lot about the what. Uh, I wonder if you'd be willing to dig a little bit into the why, which I understand is, as an economist, your work is kind of normative. But like, for instance, when you look at some of these numbers, like that marriage is so much more likely to keep a person uh, in the workforce, I do wonder you know, what, what is the cause and effect there? Is it that women are more happy to be with men who are more likely to be in the workforce? Um, or is it that men who are married to women are more likely to kind of have that provider instinct? Do you, do you have tools to, sure. to be able to tell that apart? You know, because we're human beings and we're not unidimensional. I mean, it's a, it, it, it is a complex dynamic, which, you know, which goes in both directions, but it's certainly true <clears throat> that, um, well, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's a big gap in workforce participation between black and uh, Anglo men, you know, just across the board. But married black guys are more likely to be in the workforce than unmarried Anglo guys. Mm. Okay? So in other words, the the ring factor right. <laughs> the race difference, right? The ethnic difference. And, you know, and there, there are other things I could point to like that. And it's not because there's any particular magic in this little ring that I wear on my finger. It's because it happens in general to be associated with a whole bunch of attitudes and mm. motivations and values and behaviors that tend to keep married guys in the workforce when a counterpart who looks just the same on paper except is never married wouldn't be. It's got to do with human agency. It's because we're not all you know, kind of like 
helpless atoms in this great big (laughs) probabilistic uh, equation. And I guess similarly, um, because one one of the other kind of controversial right now elements of this uh, is immigrant status, Uh, because as you point out, immigrants are much less likely to kind of be in the situation than native born. I mean, one, how big is that difference? And and two, can you talk me through kind of some of the reasons why that might be? Sure. First, let me say that I, um, I am no fan of illegal yeah. immigration. And I think that anybody who's with the Madison program yeah. kind of believes <laughs> the Constitution and rule of law. I am I'm pretty sweet on immigration. I'm very uh, strict about American law and about our democracy. And uh, so I, I like uh, I like legal immigration. But, you know, I mean, and even so, nowadays, even some of the immigration to the United States is legal, some of it. You know? right. <laughs> but, uh, but we can't tell who is which from the numbers that I play with. You know, we take everybody who's foreign born and everybody who's native born. And foreign born men are subject to human temptation like all other human beings. And let me tell you what I show in this book with that regard. By the numbers, about the hardest working guys in America are foreign born Hispanic men. Mm -hmm. Their uh, work rates and labor force participation is as high as anything that we see in the country at this point. But do a natural experiment with respect to social welfare. Look at the state of California versus the state of Texas, and I do that in the book. You know, California is more or less as close as we get to having a (laughs) European-style social welfare state in America. And Texas is Texas, right? (laughs) So (laughs) what's it like when you look at foreign-born Latino men in work rates and social benefit participation. Uh, the rates of work and, uh, and labor force participation are distinctly lower in California for these guys than they are in Texas. Mm-hmm. The rates of food stamp, disability, other welfare benefit participation is distinctly higher in California than in Texas. So are people affected by you know, welfare blandishments? Yeah, of course they are, to a degree. To a degree. Um, what, we, what we see, however, is that pretty consistently for every ethnic group, not just Latinos, for Asians, for Anglos, for Black Americans, the foreign born uh, immigrants have higher work rates. Now, there is a, um, there is a feeling in the United States that these uh, foreign born workers are taking American jobs, right? Um, And it is certainly true that if you have more of something, its price tends to go down. If you have more unskilled workers from abroad, the overall wages maybe for less skilled workers go down. I mean, that's, that's a pretty commonsensical approach. But we did a natural experiment in the United States, a very unfortunate one during the pandemic and its aftermath. In 2020 and 2021, immigration was way interrupted because people just weren't traveling and they weren't coming to the country. And so as far as I can estimate, roughly you know, roughly a million fewer uh, foreign-born workers were in our labor force at the end of 2021 uh, than we would have had if we'd had an ordinary, you know, chaotic flow like we always do. So, so what happened? Uh, were those uh, was that short fill, uh, you know, backstopped by native Amer- by native born Americans? Uh uh-uh. uh Instead, we saw we saw this extraordinary peacetime labor shortage emerge, where we both had a spike in unfilled jobs and a drop off in the total number of people in the workforce. So we have. Th- you know, the uh, the flow of foreign workers, in effect, is interrupted. We get an increase in unfilled jobs and a drop off in uh, in the workforce in the United States. So, at least in the short run, we've seen the answer to this experiment. 
That's really so different from the way I've heard most people kind of discuss the issue. So in other words, what you're saying is that part of the issue with the labor shortage was that we were having so many fewer immigrants during the pandemic, that that's one of the factors? Well, you know, again, I, I was taught um, economics, you know, back shortly after the Stone Age. So it was a very <laughs> long time ago. But, but we like to think that, you know, some, some economic principles, you know, obtained, you know, across time. One of the things that we were taught was that there is a lump of labor fallacy. In other words, don't believe the lump of labor fallacy. And the lump of labor fallacy was, you know, that the good Lord sprinkled a certain number of hours of work on every continent. And, you know, and if you take that work, then there's not going to be any more work. What happened during the pandemic looks like an incarnation of the lump of labor fallacy because the number of unfilled jobs spiked by about 4 million when the uh, shortfall of worker from trend dropped by about 4 million. Mm-hmm. They weirdly they weirdly reflect each other, which the way I was taught shouldn't necessarily be the case. Now, of that 4 million shortfall, as best I can figure out, about, about a million is immigration that didn't happen mm-hmm. during those two years. Um, there's an additional bit which is related, of course, to COVID. Um, COVID deaths did not contribute to this shortfall as much as one might think because COVID deaths were skewed to such older age groups. Mm-hmm. You know, to, uh, The overwhelming majority of COVID deaths were people over 65, and there's a lot less you know, uh, people working over those ages. There are still a number of people who are out of the workforce because of COVID. You know, we ask, we ask people about this, but it's not maybe as many as you would think. In the latest census uh, household pulse surveys, uh, it's averaging about 700,000 people who either are sick with long-term COVID and say that they can't work, or else they're home taking care of people who are you know sick with COVID. Mm-hmm. Now, 700,000 is a lot of people, but it's not... Uh, it, It's not most of 4 million, if you see what I mean. The overwhelming majority of the missing people look to be older former workers and people besides the men without work, maybe some Hmm. of the younger women that I mentioned to you as well. Hmm. Uh, I think it's interesting to split this question up into kind of the supply side and the demand side question. And your book talks a lot about about the supply side, about whether or not men are actually interested in working. Uh, But on the demand side, um, I think there are a lot of interesting questions as well, because the narrative, certainly, in terms of the way a lot of people talk about this issue, are very much in terms of the demand for jobs. So I guess one question I would have would be a lot of people blame this trend um, on a loss of manufacturing jobs. Uh, And I think I mean, I'm going to ask you to what extent this is true. It seems like a lot of what your book is saying is that it isn't true. But I guess I might throw in if there's some sense in which the narrative might be true. In other words, is it perhaps possible that because manufacturing jobs left initially that it sort of sparked this trend? Or like when you look at it, what about that kind of narrative is true versus not true? Oh, I'm glad you asked that question because it's a very important question. And I think there, the, the reason that the received wisdom mm-hmm. is that most of this problem is due to economic and structural change, which is to say to demand, you know, the drop in demand for less skilled work, the drop in demand for manufacturing jobs, the drop in demand for other sorts of work due to China's entry into the World Trade Organization or to globalization and outsourcing. I mean, all of that is true. It's just that it's not the whole story. And I don't think it's even most of the story for the USA. Now, part of what I look at in this book is what happens all around the world in other countries. And pretty much in all rich, uh, democratic, never communist polities, uh, there's been some drop in male workforce participation in the post what we need to explain is how come America's is the worst? How come we are like so spiky and harsh and consistently down? Because if you look internationally, you know, the two big countries that are the closest twins in the rich world are Canada and the U.S. 
And even with Canada, we're doing a lot worse than in Canada. Wow. So, so th- this this is part of it. But there are big things that the demand side narrative cannot explain. I mean, you mentioned manufacturing. Um, the decline in the share of employment in manufacturing in Sweden, in France, in Canada, in Australia, it's more or less the same as in the United States. Uh, so how come we've got like such worse performance than these places? Or to give another example, remember I was saying that the increase in labor force dropouts, the inactivity rate, the not in labor force rate, whatever you wish to call it, is almost a straight line up from 65 to, you know, this afternoon while we're chatting. And if if this were an economic shock or an economic demand-driven phenom, you'd expect that there'd be, you know, boom and bust cycles that would be, you know, business cycles would be, can't see them. Wow. You'd expect that you maybe be able to see where China entered the World Trade Organization, can't see it. Or like or when we invented like different disruptive technologies, can't see it. Mm. And the final, I mean, right now, the final kind of conclusive qualification, I think, 11 million unfilled jobs. Uh, you know, and not all of these are for like hedge fund managers and chemical engineers. I mean, there are millions and millions of jobs where the only skill that people need at the moment is the skill of like showing up to work regularly on time every day, you know, without being high or drunk. Yeah, and it's interesting that you bring up this example of America having by you know by far the biggest issue with this uh, because I think it's one of those kind of funny facts that is maybe very hurtful to American self-image because we certainly think of ourselves as much harder working than our compatriots across the pond um, in so many ways. And well, we are in so many yeah. ways. But we're also not in so many ways. I mean, if you take a look, Annika, if you, if you take a look at hours worked mm-hmm. for Americans who are at work. There's no rich country with right. hours worked like ours. I mean, not in Europe, uh, not in, I mean, in never communist Europe, not in, uh, not in Western Europe, uh, not in Australia, not in New Zealand, not in, uh, you know, not in Canada, not in Japan. Uh, wow. But at the same time, we also have this other tale, this other side to the problem where none of those countries have the same sort of extreme male dropout from the workforce that we have. So we've got both. Yeah. And our hours worked per week are so much higher than in Europe. And, and also when you consider, you know, it's even more, hours worked look even starker when you take our income levels into account, mm. right? Because in general, free, I will not say leisure, I will say free time. <laughs> free time is a kind of like, is something that people like to buy. You know, richer right. places have kind of more of it, you think. But so... Since our society is more affluent than most of the ones that I was describing, the fact that our hours worked or higher is even more striking. I mean, it sort of, to me, begs another question, because are, are we kind of looking at an instance of like two Americas here, so to speak? Because it seems like on the one hand, we have so many people who aren't working and who are interested in entering the workforce. And on the other hand, the people who are in the workforce are doing quite a lot of work. Like, do you, I guess, do you have any explanation for why we might have that kind of extreme bifurcation? Well, it is, it is also true that we are doing something which um, is, would have been unpredicted, I think, by first class in economics you'd take. Because people in the United States who tend to earn the most also tend to have the longest hours at work. Whereas people who you know, are, you have lower income or lower consumption from transfers or whatever, tend to have the fewest hours at work. Mm. So it's kind, of, it's kind of turned upside down, especially during the post-war era. And you know, back in 1930, uh, Keynes wrote this fantastic essay called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. Mm. I guess we'd more or less be the grandchildren, right? Uh, it's almost 100 years ago. And he boldly predicted in 1930, in the depths of the Depression, that 100 years from now, people are going to be way richer than they were when he was writing. And he's right about that. He also predicted that by more or less where we are now, 
the great problem would be what to do with all of our free time because mm. with automation and affluence, uh, the ordinary person would only be working 10 or 12 hours uh, a week. Well, that part wasn't, it hasn't come true yet. Let's put it that way. And it's also not the way that he would have expected, I don't think. I don't think he would have expected that there would be a huge swath of people doing uh, no time, you know, uh, you know, working age men doing no work at all mm. and others who are quite affluent who are, you know, working like crazy. And on the topic of Europe, because you kind of alluded to this a little bit before, but I want to draw back to it. Um, there is definitely a part of this narrative as, as we see it discussed um, that has to do with the welfare system and the welfare state. And that is like something the right has been up in a tizzy about for many, many, many years. Um, but it's sort of an interesting counterfactual that Europe, even though they have a much, much more generous welfare state, also um, has much higher workforce par- participation than we do by quite a bit. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, is it the case that uh, that the welfare state is still a piece of the story, just not such a large piece? I, I would say that the welfare state is a piece of the story, but we haven't discussed it. Economists haven't discussed it the right way because economists understand one part of the human personality, but not all of the human personality. So um, the U.S. came very late to the uh, welfare state party. Uh, it, we, we did have Social Security, uh, you know, um, and some employment insurance uh, started in the Great Depression, but we didn't really get a, uh, you know, the trappings of European style social welfare state until the 1960s. Uh, we're, we're very late to that party. And, you know, if you ask any any of our friends in Europe or uh, Canada or Australia, New Zealand, elsewhere, they'll say that the United States uh, social welfare guarantee is very stingy. And, you know, maybe they're right. Um, certainly by their perspective, they, uh, they think they're right. Um, it is possible for even relatively small incentives to have big consequences. And what we have seen in the United States with the men without work problem is a shift from work to an alternative, seemingly work-free existence, partly financed by the social welfare state. I mean, before the pandemic, I mean, what my book showed is that before the pandemic, over half of the guys who have dropped out of the workforce are getting at least one benefit from uh, a, one disability program. Uh, Two thirds live in homes that are getting at least one benefit. That does not allow you to live a princely life. I mean, uh, you'd be living on a standard of consumption that's much lower than if uh, if you're in the working world. Ironically, not at the bottom of the income or consumption spectrum. The people who tend to be in the lowest fifth are like single mothers. Uh, guys who are neither working nor looking for work tend to be in the fifth that's right above that. Ironically, that was the fifth that used to be called the working class. Mm. Oh, this is the non-working <laughs> class now. And part of what has made this possible are uh, social welfare benefits. I, I do not say, and I never have said, that social welfare benefits cause this, because I don't think that can be proved. What is incontestable is that they finance it. When, you, when we talk about causality, so, so social welfare benefits, and this is, I think, kind of really the heart of the issue that we've kind of been skirting around, social welfare benefits enable, they don't necessarily cause what can we say about what we know about the causes? Um, well, we've seen a couple of really big things happen since 65 when this uh, phenomenon took off. For the first two decades of the post-war era, it, there was no sign of this problem, really. Um, since about 65, some people were dated maybe to the pill, but in, say, 63, say, but say since 65, um, We've seen a revolution in the family, and um, we've seen a fragmenting and a breaking down of the traditional order in the family. And as I'd mentioned already, 
guys without kids at home and guys who are never married are distinctly less likely to be in the workforce. Uh, back in 65, practically all the guys were married and most of them had kids at home. So that's one thing. There's the uh, social welfare benefits, which you mentioned. That was another big phenomenon. Uh, there was the uh, opening... A, once again of immigration, which had more or less come to a close with World War I. Although we think of ourselves as a nation of immigrants, we had very restrictive immigration procedures until the mid-60s. So we've had, a, we've had the immigration uh, component, which we've discussed already. What we haven't discussed is crime and punishment. Crime mm. got out of control in the 60s and Crime trends got a lot worse in the 70s and the 80s and maybe even in part of the 90s. Um, and it was followed by a wave of punishment. And we think now about mass incarceration in the United States, which is very, very different from other countries, uh, very different from all other rich countries. What we don't talk about is the fact that for every person who's behind bars in the U.S., there are about 10 people in society who've got a felony in their background, a uh, felony conviction. So we have, you know, we have 10 times as many ex-coms in society as we have people behind bars. And that means that about one in seven adult men now has a felony conviction in his background. This is hugely different from other rich countries I think that this is part of what explains the mystery that we're in, because for reasons that I can't explain to you, I mean, it's, it's maddening to me as a numbers nerd, but, and, but, and also as a citizen, but for reasons I can't explain, the, the U.S. government, in its wisdom, seems absolutely disinterested in putting together any statistical information on the 20-plus million invisible ex in our country about, about their work, about their living conditions, about their health, about, you know, about, and not even, not even about their, you know, you don't have that much stuff about even, you know, kind of recidivism and stuff. They're kind of, they, they're under this cloak of invisibility, which makes it very difficult for anybody who wants positively to try to get them reintegrated into the workforce or society or families to do anything, you know, programmatic because there's no evidence for evidence-based policies. And I'm really happy that, that you brought that up because it was definitely one thing that really struck me about your book, um, the, the focus on criminality and how that affects these numbers. The way that people discuss it, um, I mean, it sort of makes sense. You look at it and you're, you know, you're like, okay, do I sympathize more with the criminals, you know, and, and how difficult their life is, or do I sympathize more with trying to, you know, do this sort of 1980s style, like crackdown, we don't want to tolerate any of this. Um, but I think that what you do is kind of take the bird's eye view of, of what this actually means economically and kind of on a broader level. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that, because to me, it raises such a, a tough question, because sort of the elephant in the room when you talk about um, rate of uh, rate of felonies and rate of incarceration is that, well, all these people kind of did commit crimes. And so I guess when you look at it, how do you deal with addressing both the fact that a lot of these people committed crimes and the fact that it's just really causing great strain on our workforce to have such a high proportion of people coming out of, of prison. It was a lot easier to write about this uh, in the first edition than it is now. Much easier to write about this when crime rates have been going down for almost a generation than when they are going up. Talking about this when crime rates are going up is very difficult salesmanship. Uh, and it's difficult salesmanship for a person like me who tends to be very much in favor of public safety. Uh, I mean, just to put my own personal cards on the table, I have a three daughters and I want them to be safe in addition to everything else that happens in society. So I recognize at the same time that there are millions and millions and millions of people who are not recidivists. I mean, recidivists are a immense social problem. But there are other people who are not recidivists. We've got this system which is supposed to have you, you know, pay your debt to society through your conviction and sentencing and so forth. And if you were not a recidivist, 
uh, there is a question about how you repair your employment reputation, how you try to earn a living so that you can kind of establish yourself and establish re-entering into family life. Others, you know, how you how you become a uh, you know, how you become a participating member of, uh, of society again. And there are lots and lots of uh, charitable and voluntary efforts all across the country that try to serve this function. But in effect, they're all, you know, they're all blinded because they're doing the they're doing their own thing, and it's not even like a thousand points of light because you can't see what the other points of light are. And I think our civil society would function better if we had the information I'm describing because we have this glorious federal experiment going on all the time everywhere, and we could see kind of like what appears to be working and what doesn't appear to be working if we had, if we just had that spotlight. And so I guess kind of starting to wrap this up, uh, when we zoom out to the big picture, one of the things that you point out in your recent op-ed in the Wall Street Journal um, is that we're just as wealthy overall as we have been before, uh, that like our overall GDP, I mean, it's suffering for various reasons, I mean, particularly COVID, but overall, this kind of small sliver um, has not seemed necessarily to drag down our overall economic uh, economic growth. And so I think it's very interesting because for so many economists, uh, the overall GDP growth, overall economic growth, that is the end goal. And yet you've kind of focused on this one piece of it, the, the underbelly, so to speak. Why is that? Uh, why do you think that it's so important to focus on this factor? A and B. Do you think that there's a point in at which it'll catch up with us, in which maybe our overall economic growth is going to suffer because of this? Well, as I was saying when we started our conversation, there's nothing good that comes out of this. It's not like the it's not like the men without work are doing community service and boning up on their Schopenhauer or whatever. You know, it, it's 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 much, much, much more likely to be on the road towards the deaths of despair. Okay. So having a huge share of prime age men inactive and dependent and helpless, what does it mean? Slower economic growth, bigger income and wealth gaps in our country, more welfare dependence probably, um, more pressure on fragile families, less social mobility, less social trust, less participation in society. I mean, there just isn't anything good that comes out of this. And we have been able to uh, we have been able to create an extraordinary amount of wealth in our country despite this and a number of other problems I've elsewhere termed the new misery. Uh, but um, you know, we do we do live in a society where you know, kind of the fortunes of everyone should matter to us, and we've we've disconnected. I mean, during your living life experience, we have disconnected the trends for wealth, for economic growth, and for work, and. If you have my lived experience, you know, a generation or more older than you, uh, is my memory plastic is that these three things go together in a healthy society. I don't think it's healthy to have these uh, pointers going in big different directions. Yeah, it's a really interesting note uh, to end on because it is like surprising to me that it's even possible for those three to go in in different directions. I don't know if you have any final thoughts on what would even enable that to be the case? I don't think it can happen forever. I don't think that this is, uh, I don't think this is indefinite. I can tell you that uh, I don't have to be like a, a political scientist to observe that when you spend a couple of decades in a world where there's more wealth for the wealth holders and less work for the workers, you're going to like frame something for a pretty good populist, you know, reaction. It may not happen, but it may. And I, I think we're kind of living in that world now. Um, I like very much the idea of having escalators that aren't broken in America, 
that, it, that everybody should have an opportunity to succeed, I think will be a healthier, happier society. I also think, by the way, that will be a more secure society, not just domestically, but because the consent of the governed will work so that people will think uh, our international policy is something that protects us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for the time, Nick. Uh, it's a really interesting discussion and a really kind of uh, uh, unusual, I guess, take on how people don't necessarily look at all sides of some of the narratives that we most commonly talk about in the news. So I really appreciate you taking the time. This was very interesting. Thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Well, there you have it, Madisonians. Nicholas Eberstadt on his book, Men Without Work. That's all for today. Again, don't forget to like, follow, and subscribe. And we'll see you next time here on Madison's Notes. Madison's Notes.